could only happen in Berlin. A brand new Soviet interceptor fell from the sky. It crashed in a lake in the British sector. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. In April 1966, a state-of-the-art Soviet aircraft, the Yak-28P, crashed into the British sector of West Berlin. This intelligence gift to the Allied forces resulted in a tense confrontation with the Soviets. We speak with historian Bernd von Kostka of the Allied Museum in berlin Dahlem, who has researched this story for his upcoming book, Capital of Spies, Intelligence Agencies in Berlin During the Cold War, which he co-authors with Sven Felix Kellerhoff. The book will be published in October in the US and in December 2021 in the UK. Now, this podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our Patreon. So if you are enjoying the podcast, you can show your support via a small or large monthly donation. Plus, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. And I'd like to thank Beam2, Woodhead4780 and Treefella for their five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. So, back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Bernd to our Cold War conversation. What was Cold War Berlin like in 1966? Well, at the time, the Berlin Wall was already erected five years ago in 1961, and everybody in West and East Berlin was uh, used to this situation now. So the people could cope with this, uh, you can call it uh, the normality of the abnormal. And in 1966, the divided city Berlin belonged to the everyday life of the city, as well as the four occupation powers in the city belong to everyday life. But obviously the crash we will talk about today was definitely not everyday life. No, although overflights of West Berlin by Soviet aircraft was quite a regular occurrence, I understand. That's right, especially in the 60s. Um, since 1945, uh, there was a flight control zone on a radius of 20 kilometers from a former Allied control building called Kleistpark. And all four occupation nations were allowed to fly within this control zone. And the Soviets were using this right to annoy and to provoke. And the presence of Soviet aircraft in the airspace of West Berlin had been a terrible nuisance to the Western powers and to the Berliners for years. And actually, one year uh, before, in 1965, several fighter jets had flown overhead and had massively disrupted a session of the German Bundestag in the Berlin Congress Hall. So the situation of Soviet fighters over West Berlin was indeed not new. Can you just talk to me about the circumstances of the crash? Well, on the 6th of uh, April, a pair of uh, Soviet Air Force Yak-28P uh, fighters took off from Fino Airfield. This is uh, located uh, near uh, by Eberswalde in East Germany and approximately 40 kilometers away from Berlin. 
The pilot was Boris Kapustin and his navigator was Yuri Janov. They try to make their way to another airfield in East Germany that is called Köthen. So they wanted to make the same trip three days earlier, and I think that's quite important. But they failed to do so because of engine problems, and they had to return to the Fino airfield. So mechanics were working three days to solve the problem. But 12 minutes after the takeoff, at uh, around uh, half past three, after midday, um, one of the pilots radioed air traffic controllers uh, with an emergency situation, declaring that one of the Yaks, two turbojet engines, had failed and that the aircraft was becoming, becoming unstable and uh, difficult to control and to maneuver. Soviet military controllers ordered to take an emergency landing at Schönefeld Airport in East Berlin, which is not far away. It's actually around the corner. But probably further problems with the second engine appeared, and they were unable to keep control of the aircraft. And eyewitness said uh, the plane dropped like a stone. So the pilot, uh, Boris Kapustin, and his navigator had around 30, 40 less than seconds, less than a minute to check their options and to make their decision. So they were over West Berlin and they had the radio permission to eject, but neither Kapustin nor Janov did eject. Instead, Kapustin wanted to take control of the aircraft long enough to avoid a series of apartment blocks before crashing into the Lake Stößensee and the British controlled sector of West Berlin in the district of Spandau. Seconds later, the 21-meter-long aircraft disappeared in the lake. Bern, I've, I've looked at the, uh, the map of Berlin, and the, the Stossen say doesn't look like a very big piece of water to crash into if it was a, a guided crash. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Indeed, if you go to Google Maps and uh, look at the Stößensee, it's a very, very tiny lake. You know, Berlin has a lot of waterways and a lot of lakes in the city and around the city. But this Stößensee was uh, approximately 150 meters on his smallest width and uh, the widest point is only 300 meters and the total length is a bit more than one kilometer. So it's actually quite difficult uh, to hit especially into the Stößensee and even though the Stößensee is on three sides surrounded by forest, it's only one side uh, where you have a, a huge housing area that uh, the pilot probably wants to avoid. But if he wants to hit the Stößensee on purpose, you know, that was actually a good maneuver, especially if both engines were not working. We talked about the Yak-28P. What what sort of plane what was this? What, what was its role? Well, the Yakovlev Yak-28 is a swept-wing turbojet-powered combat aircraft used by the Soviet Union, and it was uh, produced initially as a tactical bomber. It was also manufactured for reconnaissance and electronic warfare, and as an interceptor known by the NATO reporting name Firebar. And it began to enter the service in uh, 1960, and it served until the fall of the Soviet Union and was used until 1992. But um, Saying that, in April 1966, the Yak-28P inter interceptor was nearly unknown to the Western forces. It had only been introduced to Soviet Air Force units in the GDR a few months earlier, and the American military liaison mission, mission in the GDR had only managed to take a few photographs of a Yak on a flight over East Germany. And, and that's all. And now one of these unknown interceptors uh, came down in British territory. What was the, the Allies' immediate reaction to, to this event? And how, how did they know it had come down? Yes, well, uh, American and British military intelligence services were monitoring Soviet distress call from monitoring facility at the Teufelsberg as well as uh, nearby RF Gato 
at the time of the crash. Later on, that, that started in the 60s, and later on, uh, they had a system uh, monitoring all air traffic and all air conversation. From They had a combination of systems from Teufelsberg, from Gato, from Tempelhof, and from Marienfelde. Those, these were the four stations that built a net that could listen into the east up to 500 kilometers. So in Teufelsberg was just in service until the early 60s. So that was the beginning of those monitoring deep into the east. But this enables the Western powers to know that there's a problem and to send members of the Brixmiths, the British Brixmiths in West Berlin, uh, to cordon off uh, the crash site approximately one and a half hour after the crash. And the Soviets arrived nearly one hour after the British arrived. So the first divers of the Berlin police uh, on that afternoon, on that early evening, were trying to gain some information, but could not definitely say if the pilots were still in the cockpit. Uh, that was approximately uh, 20 meters deep under the surface, and it was dark by then, and the lake was very muddy. And because the fate of the pilots was not clear, the Berlin police, as well as British military police and helicopters, were searching the surrounding area throughout the whole night. So on that first evening, the Allies didn't know what aircraft it was and also weren't sure whether the pilots had actually got out or, or where they were. That, that's correct. Uh, so first of all, you have to understand that even five hours after the crash, the British had still no idea what kind of plane crashed into the lake, into their territory. One of the first on the scene was a member of the British Royal Air Force, squadron leader Maurice Taylor, who rode to the crash site with a boat and began taking photographs of the area and snapping several shots of the wreckage of the Soviet aircraft. The tail of the plane, only a couple of uh, centimeters, uh, less uh, half a meter probably, the tail looked out of the water. And on that night, analyzing the photos, they discovered that it was a Yak 28P, and this was really a big fish on the line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say an early Christmas present <laughs> or a late Christmas present if it... If it was uh, April. Now, I'm presuming the Soviets weren't just standing around waiting for the uh, British. What what were the Soviets up to? Well, indeed, uh, on the very first day, there was a very uh, critical situation on that day uh, of the crash when the Soviets arrived, as I said, uh, one hour after the British arrived, uh, with an am amphibious vehicle at the lake. And an unauthorized Soviet amphibious vehicle in the Stößensee in the British sector could have led to a major problem and to a major incident. So the Soviet delegation demanded that all activities should be seized until Soviet units arrived to recover the aircraft. And uh, not uh, surprisingly, the British rejected this demand. But uh, obviously, the Soviets were not happy with this answer and uh, tension arise, and uh, Major Jonathan Blackhouse, a British interpreter, was present and wanted to prevent a standoff with armed soldiers on both sides. So we entered into talks with a commanding general at the side, General Bulanov, who finally ordered uh, the troops to uh, fall back away from the lake. And then the Soviets erected a camp just uh, approximately 100 meters away from the lake uh, with approximately 40 soldiers in the camp. And they stayed there for the whole time of the operation. And uh, later in the British documents, uh, this situation uh, on that first day uh, was described to be critical. But on the other hand, the British had the impression that the Soviet side did not want to risk an armed confrontation on that issue. And legally, to, to have it legally, uh, the Soviets had no right to act in any way within the British sector in Berlin. Well, the, the only area that they had 
access to or control over was the uh, Tear Garden War Memorial, wasn't it? They, they could go there. They could go to the Tear Garden uh, Memorial and guard their memorial. Uh, that was done on a daily basis. And also they were um, in uh, the four power team uh, guarding Hess at Sp Spandau Prison. So uh, these uh, two uh, areas, uh, that's these were the two areas they were physically going to. And only a handful of people went to the third area, which is still under four power control. And that was uh, in the building I just mentioned, the Kleist Park. And there was the BASC, uh, the, the air traffic control uh, office with all four powers. And in there, there was also a small uh, Soviet team. But these were the only three spots in West Berlin where the Soviets regularly went to. And I think I read somewhere that with the the major Jonathan Backhouse incident, that weapons were were cocked. Is, have you found any evidence of that in the British records? Uh, as I said, it is described as a critical situation, but I cannot remember that uh, situation uh, that the, that a standoff uh, with uh, weapons actually aiming uh, at each other. Uh, that it was that critical. <laughs> it's probably somebody trying to dramatize it a little bit more than it was, but it sounds like it was a very, it was a tense situation. Yes, that's definite, yeah. Now, we, we spoke earlier about the pilots, and obviously the fate of the pilots wasn't clear on the night of, of the 6th, but I, I understand that the following morning, um, some British divers arrive. Indeed, as I said, uh, first of all, they were taking divers which were on the scene. These were uh, police divers, uh, but it was uh, dark, it was muddy. So next day, uh, professional um, Royal Navy divers from Portsmouth landed uh, at the British airport Gatto in Berlin. And now the search and the recovery efforts could be done properly. When at work at the crash site on the 7th of April, the main concern was to raise the bodies of the two crew members. It was beyond doubt, uh, approximately um, a quarter to six, that both men were dead and still in the cockpit. So that was for sure at that time on the second day. But um, Great care had to be taken in pulling them out of their seats because ejection seats, uh, though they had not been fired, could very could have been damaged uh, by the crash. Uh, so divers had to be very carefully. But finally, on the 8th April, towards 3 o'clock in the morning, the bodies were handed over to a Soviet delegation with full military honors. And this is also an answer to one of the rumors in former East Germany you can still hear today. And they often say that the British did not take care uh, about the dead pilots and that they only handed the bodies back after three days. But going through the documents, I can say that that was part, probably part of the GDR propaganda at the time which is just repeated nowadays. But this was done exactly after 36 hours, and I'm certain that uh, Soviet documents would tell you the same timetable, but unfortunately uh, we do not have access to those Soviet documents. Yeah, yeah, because there's a... Uh, again, it's something I've read, and I'm sorry, I can't remember where I read it from, or maybe I imagined it, I don't know. But the, the British were trying to delay the soviets by saying that they hadn't been able to get the bodies out yet but from from what you've seen from the british record that the british were trying to do it as quickly as they could but were concerned about the state of these ejector seats particularly that's right a delay of uh things to discover will come later in the history <laughs> that was okay. that was part of the intelligence uh coup they had but not when they discovered the bodies so that was uh primarily so that's for sure they they took care of the dead pilots, and that was one of the first things they did. And when that was out of hand, they were looking at the intelligence stuff uh, they were aiming at, yeah. 
Right. And, w- and when you say that the bodies were handed over to the Soviet delegation with full military honours, what, what, what does that mean, full military honours? As I remember, it was a, a group of soldiers uh, saluting. Uh, and um, like when the dead body of Major Nicholson, who was shot in uh, East Germany by a Soviet sentry, was handed over uh, the Klinika Bridge, uh, the thing is, you have five soldiers on the right hand side, five soldiers on the left hand side doing a salute when the body uh, entered the bridge and when it was taken into the car, things like that. The British are now aware that they've got a big fish. What what do they do to try and get secrets from the aircraft? Because presumably the Soviets, the other side of the lake, are, are watching the lake 24-7 to make sure there's no... Uh, Dodginess. Yeah, that's right. Well, obviously they 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 did uh, assume that <laughs> something <laughs> something will happen underwater, and indeed uh, that's what happened underwater. So the British divers from Portsmouth uh, also recovered items of military interest. This included the radar equipment, uh, which was then sent to England for examination. Uh, It had been intended that the work in England uh, should be done pretty quickly uh, for the wreck was to be returned to the Soviet authorities on the 13th of April. So the parts that belong in the cockpit would need to be reinstalled before then if the British wanted to leave no evidence that they had been examined the cockpit. So, however, the electronic equipment from the nose cone did not end up being sent back to Berlin by or in time, or by the time the fuselage was handed over to the Soviets on uh, the harbor on the afternoon of the 13th of April. And uh, again, this is a very uh, unique uh, story. Uh, The meeting point on the river had only been agreed on after tough negotiations with the Soviets. Uh, The wreckage was transported by a British ferry to a point near the East German frontier on the water and was then loaded onto a Soviet ferry. (laughs) And this is, uh, can you imagine this strange situation? You know, you meet on a a, a border frontier and and load stuff from one ferry to another. So that's pretty weird. And General Bulanov, who had been entrusted with uh, conducting the negotiations on the part of the Soviet Union, He took the receipt of the wreckage and it was agreed that a further search would be carried out for the remaining elements of the aircraft that were very important parts like the radar, engines uh, and other bits and pieces that were missing. So more significant, uh, however, was the absence absence of a very important bit and that was the identification uh, friend or foe, the IFF, And that set was not returned uh, in the wreckage on the 13th of April. And the Yak-28 carried a sophisticated radar system known as the skip spin, which gave the Soviet fighter the capability to look up and down as well as ahead when doing scans. So this radar system was of great interest to both the Americans and the British militaries. And it was a severe blow to the Soviet military leadership that its IFF system no longer remained a secret after the crash into the Stürzensee. The Soviets must have immediately smelt a rat here. The fact that probably the most important bit of the (laughs) aircraft... They weren't getting back. They were just getting the scrap metal. <laughs> yeah, but but they had probably they had uh, the the hope that it would be handed over in the second part. And I will tell you about the second part. Uh, the next part of the recovery program was to find the wings and the engines. These uh, components had been torn off on impact and were now widely scattered in the lake. 
the Soviet representative at the crash site aware that these parts of the operation would take more time had moved into quarters and as I meant into a tent city near the lake uh, since the 6th of April and it was the idea of the commandant of the British sector the Major General Sir uh, John Nelson to delay the return of the engines so they could be examined. But the only problem at the time is uh, that the British had not found any engine at the time. So how much time would be needed for finding the first engine? Uh, how much time would be needed for the examination of the engines? And for how long could the Soviet military be kept waiting with the rising suspicions? As you said, uh, they were uh, watching the operation. And the Western forces in Berlin did not know anything about this uh, commanding general, General Bulanov. So they were unable to assess how he might react to the planned intelligence maneuver. But when the first engine was found on the 18th of April, although the British kept it a secret and took it to the Royal Air Force base in Gato on the 20th of April, in the following days, the engine of the Yak-28 was examined in detail in one of the hangars by British experts who had been especially flown into Berlin for that purpose. And during that time, the Soviet representative, um, General Bulanov, in the belief that neither engine had been found, complained daily about the inefficiency of the British operation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when finally the second engine was discovered on the 25th of uh, April, the British gave the Soviets the impression that this was the first engine they had found. However, time was running out and it had been decided in London that the parts being examined in England would arrive back in Berlin on the 1st of May. The British therefore announced on the 28th of April that they had discovered the second engine, even though it had in fact been in Gato, Gato for a week for examination. So both engines were finally handed over on the 2nd of May, and General Bulanov wrote to the British and pointed out that an important part was still missing, although he did not describe in detail what it was, it was the part of the radar system. And it is doubtful whether he believed the claim of the British that any components that had not been returned must still be on the bottom of the lake. Now, you can imagine poor General Bolanov's uh, increasing frustration there. I understand the British used quite a, a sneaky technique to, to get the engine away from the Soviets, because obviously it's a large piece of metal that you couldn't just put on a boat and chuck a bit of tarpaulin over it and hope the Soviets didn't notice. I understand they, they sort of somehow managed to tow it to another part of the lake. Yeah, they tow it to another part of the lake and then they, they um, mantled it uh, under a, underneath the water, under a boat, and transported it on the waterway near, uh, near, near Gato so it was out of sight for the Soviet delegation. <laughs> it's, all, it's all clever stuff. It's all very clever stuff here. But even and, though, uh, you know, the Soviet would have done the same, and I'm 100% sure Bulanov knew, <laughs> knew, oh, yeah. knew what they were doing there underwater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So how does this finish? So the, the Soviets just agree or, or agree with the British that, they can't find these other bits of the aircraft. That's right. The Soviets had no right to search for the bits and pieces themselves. So basically they had to believe uh, when the British told them, sorry, that's all we could find. Uh, if there are smaller parts, the lake is very muddy. And uh, because of the crash, it could be, in, it could be shattered for, for, for 100 meters whatsoever. Uh, so they just have to believe what the British told them, that uh, they did everything to find all bits and pieces and that they gave back everything they found, which is not the case. But they cannot do more than believe uh, what the British told them. And and the other bits that the British hung on to, are they in a museum somewhere or have they just 
disappeared? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would. Uh, it would be clever to uh, display them in a museum. <laughs> maybe in a, for the divers in Portsmouth. Maybe they have. I, th I think they have a, a, a naval museum there in Portsmouth. It would be pretty clever to have an uh, uh, exhibition on that on there. But I haven't. I haven't come across uh, any of those parts being uh, examined in Great Britain and not being sent back to Berlin. No, they'd be good being exhibited at the um, the Luftwaffe Museum at Gatow, actually. That that would be a good place for it. How is this incident remembered in in Germany now? And and what was the what was the impact at the time amongst the West Berliners? Well, at the time, it was uh, the Berlin mayor Willy Brandt, uh, who uh, a couple of years later became the chancellor of the Federal Republic. And he, at the time, found the most uh, fitting words when he spoke of the crash a few days after it take place. And he acknowledged the bravery of the Soviet pilot and the navigator for sacrificing their own life in order to avoid a disaster. So that was the, yeah, the way it was remembered at the time. It was obviously in the, in the radio news, more or less daily, and also in at the TV news. But nowadays, uh, Boris Kapustin and uh, Yuri Yanov were hailed as heroes uh, also in East Germany and the Soviet Union for having maneuvered the interceptor over the residential area of West Berlin and uh, crashed their plane into the lake. And a memorial was erected in their honor in the park of Fino in Brandenburg. That's the area where the plane actually started in '66. And after the unification of Germany, the district of Spandau, where the Stößensee is uh, placed, unveiled a commemorative plaque for both men on the West Berlin Bridge of the Stößensee in 1992. Uh, unfortunately, it's pure coincidence and bad luck that for the last 10 years, there is a construction fence, a side fence on the Stößensee Bridge. So pedestrians can hardly identify or even read uh, the commemorative plaque for 10 years now. You say they were hailed as, as heroes in the Soviet Union. Are they memorialized there at all? I didn't know that until uh, two months ago. Uh, in January, there was a, um, a radio report uh, published by Deutschland Radio, and the, the female journalist uh, uh, got into contact with me because she wanted to know if we have any additional information uh, on that uh, incident. And she told me, and she sent me the link, and she told me that she traveled to the Soviet Union to meet the widow of the pilot, uh, Kapustin, the widow of Boris Kapustin. And the journalist was uh, astonished to hear and to interview a sculpture in Moscow who was working on a memorial for both pilots, Kapustin and Yanov. So today's Russia is looking for heroes uh, from the Cold War period and is also willing to praise them uh, with, a, with a memorial and a sculpture. Every few years uh, there in the Russian newspapers, uh, an article appears that is dealing with the yak crash in West Berlin and the two uh, pilot heroes. And on one article that even suggested that the German Chancellor Angela Merkel herself does worry about the welfare of the widow and the children of those two pilots today in Russia. And when I listened to this radio report uh, and uh, the widow obviously uh, proudly mentioned the Angela Merkel episode, uh, I, as a listener, feel somehow sorry for her because you know that this is not the case. So Angela Merkel does not worry about the welfare of uh, Kapustin's or Janov's widow. But the widow, she lived in her own bubble of history where her husband is a hero, and I do not doubt that he is one, at least for her and probably for the Russian government.
And in the former GDR, there are still groups who remember this incident. And I think every year there is a wrestling ceremony uh, near this memorial in, in Fino. And uh, they are present there. But in West Berlin, only a few people remember this crash in 1966. And in former West Germany, I would say it is basically unknown. I think you, you said to me earlier that um, one of the pilot's sons managed to get some more information out of the Soviet files. Yes. During this radio report, uh, the journalist also not only met uh, Kapustin's wife, but he also met his son. He was uh, six years and living in East uh, Germany when uh, the crash happened. So his son later uh, entered either the military or the intelligence service, uh, but nevertheless, he was able to look at his father's documents in the archive. And uh, he said, and this is the common common way it is seen in the Soviet Union that Kapustin and Yanov did get the order to eject. And the we and our saying is that they got the permission to eject and that it was their own will to maneuver to maneuver the, the plane uh, into the lake. But uh, the 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 saying in, in Russia is that they got the order to eject and so they yeah don't they don't obey orders and probably the idea was that the plane should crash uh, brutally and explode uh, when it hit the ground but for me uh, somehow it I have the impression they were just looking for scapegoats and the government could not say well look, boys, we have an airplane that's falling from the sky. No, they have to find someone who, who didn't obey orders. And uh, so obviously it was uh, Kapustin and Yanov uh, who were regarded as heroes, but I would say second-class heroes. So you have streets in the um, town where Kapustin lived. Streets were street was named after him, and there were also schools named after Kapustin and Yanov. But they didn't get the 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 top top notch fame of a real Soviet Russian hero in the Cold War area. So they were only second class heroes, I would say. So were were they awarded any? form of medal or decoration posthumously yes they were giving a medal but not uh, the highest one and uh, the lady in the <laughs> the lady in the report says the medal they were given was given to approximately uh, <laughs> half a million soldiers before so yes they, they received the medal but not a very important one and this story that we've you know that we've covered today is only one chapter from your upcoming book capital of spies isn't it uh, that's right uh, it's only i would say six or seven pages uh, in our book uh, which has more than 300 pages so the chapter we cover today is just indeed one small story in the book when does the book come out it's in the process of translation at the moment and the publisher is planning to publish it in October in the United States and in December in uh, in England in uh, Great Britain. So uh, roughly at the end of the year, it is in both countries available. Right. It sounds like a must-have book for anybody interested in the history of Berlin and intelligence operations in Berlin. The book is called Capital of Spies, Intelligence Agencies in Berlin During the Cold War. And uh, Bernd has co-authored that with uh, journalist Sven Felix Kellerhoff. Um, so watch out for that. Bernd, overall, you know, th this incident was obviously very significant in 1966. But now, sort of looking back on it, what would you say is your view on its uh, context? Well, first of all, it's always tragic when, when people died uh, during such an event. And uh, it leaves a lot of space, um, I wouldn't say for speculation, but for different opinions. 
as I said, you have a special opinion on that incident in West uh, Berlin, uh, in East Germany, in Russia. And um, I think uh, this story has everything that's needed to be a good Cold War story, you know, um, Uh, as I, as I just described it, it was it was so weird. It's one of those episodes that could only happen in Berlin. A brand new Soviet interceptor fell from the sky. It crashed in a lake in the British sector. Two people died. Uh, intelligence operations started under the eyes of the Soviet officers in tents near the lake. Uh, the fuselage were handed over from barge to barge on the frontier on the water. And after 55 years, the pilots were regarded heroes in the East and probably forgotten heroes in the West. So, um, yes, you have a lot of aspects to look at in this episode, and that makes it so interesting. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Mark Labance, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Frederick Esposito, Jack Madwed, Todd Lemieux and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.